This episode has been sponsored by Connor Insurance, an auto owner's insurance company. Hi, this is Abby at Connor Insurance. There have been record amounts of rain all across the country this year. Most damage occurs when water backs up in your drains and basement fixtures. If you have a basement, you need to check the limit your policy provides for water backup. If you aren't sure how to check, just give me a call or visit us at ConnorINS.com. Shepherd has been serving the children of Indianapolis and helping families for 34 years. We work to break the cycle of poverty on the near east side of Indianapolis because we love the children in our neighborhood. We are privileged to watch our neighbors grow physically, emotionally, spiritually, and academically through the relationships we build every day. Partnered with Shepherd by donating $34 to celebrate 34 years. Visit shepherdcommunity.org slash BLF to join us. And now the show that bridges the gap between faith and business. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Hello, everyone. This is Ray Hilbert, and I am your host here at Bottom Line Faith. And we would like to welcome you back for another episode of the program where we get to talk with guests from around the country, north to south, east to west, and we really learn how these great leaders are living out their faith in the marketplace. We talk with CEOs and owners, the occasional celebrity or athlete, but we really focus on what it looks like to live our faith in the marketplace. And we want to be an encouragement to you as a follower of Jesus in living out your faith and leadership. Our tagline here at Bottom Line Faith is we're looking to bridge that gap between faith and business is in fact, eternal business, real life. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm really excited coming from the Philadelphia area. Oh my gosh, Liz Becerra, who is the Chief Revenue Officer for Financial GPS is my guest today. Liz, welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Thank you, thank you, I'm excited to be here. Well, listen, you have a very interesting background. I wanna learn about that background in just a moment, but take take just a, a few moments here, uh, Liz, and share with us about your company, Financial GPS, who you guys are, what you do, and your particular role, and then we'll, we'll get to the backstory of your story. Sure, so Financial GPS, we're based out of Philadelphia, and our primary thing is just helping small businesses understand their numbers. So we do all of that by maintaining the books, doing accounting and bookkeeping, but everything that we do is virtual. So every quarter we send our clients videos alongside their reports and we explain to them what those numbers mean because realistically a, a good percentage of, of business owners don't fully understand what the numbers mean. And we just help tell the story. We always say numbers have a story to tell and we tell them the story and we help them to really understand it so that they can have control of their business. So that's really what we do. Yeah. Okay. That, and that just kind of triggers a thought or a question for me. So um, virtually, how, how does this kind of work? You know, um, this seems like an industry that uh, you guys might be cutting some new territory, some new ground in. You know, I'm thinking about that annual meeting or quarterly meetings with my accountant, mm -hmm. someone who's going to help me watch the numbers. How's that kind of look from a virtual standpoint? What, what stands out? What's different? So it's interesting because We've had to kind of deal with some, I guess you can call them stigmas when it comes to around, around to accounting. So a lot of people think that they only talk to their accountant once a year when it's time for taxes. We try to break that by, by opening up conversation every month with them. We reach out to them, hey, let's talk about this. Hey, we noticed a change happened here. Or hey, there's a couple red flags. Let's tackle it now so we can get ahead of it. So we do like, uh, we'll do Zoom calls with our clients, you know, or sometimes we'll sit with them. We'll have them come to our office, you know, like throughout the year and they'll just come and have a face-to-face -face conversation. But our thing is always just constant communication. So it'll be a video call. And then, like I said, every quarter we send them a, a specialized custom video just for their business explaining their numbers. So that's how wow. we do it virtually, um, which is interesting for them because they're just like, wow, like I've never talked to my accountant this much, but it, you should so that we can help you understand the business better. Yeah. So thanks for that kind of framework there. And so um, maybe the size and range types of clients that, that your firm serves. So we serve really a lot of different industries, which is pretty fun because I get to learn a lot about different industries like real estate and restaurants. Um, we have e-commerce. Um, so we, we've learned how to just kind of navigate and we figured out this formula for us of accounting and how to 
separated by different industries. And so we already have like this whole system set up where, okay, we have real estate. We know how that happens. Oh, okay. We have a restaurant. We know what the system is or the process is for that. So it's interesting. We get to meet a lot of different people. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is. Uh, tell us a little bit then about your role inside of the firm at, G, at Financial GPS. Sure. So my role is chief revenue officer, which basically means that it's my job to reach out to, to kind of deal with those. If, if I get a lead or if I go out networking, I'm just reaching out to people and just seeing if there's room for us to kind of come in and help them. Or if they have, you know, a lot of times people be like, Hey, I know somebody who can use accounting or, Hey, I know somebody who hasn't done their taxes for two years and they need help. So a lot of it is just following up, um, teaching. We do a lot of teaching. I love to teach. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that of just going and doing workshops or, um, doing videos, we do a whole lot of videos on YouTube. So everything is just kind of just trying to teach people step by step as easy as, as, as we can to make it something that they can grasp and understand and kind of walk away with. Oh, that's great. Listen, and we're going to transition in just a moment to more of your personal story and your background, living out your faith and those sorts of things. But one of the things that we love to do here at Bottom Line Faith is really also bring good tips, good business value, because our audience are, you know, business owners, CEOs, and so forth, who are listening to this conversation. What would you say is perhaps the top one or two mistakes that the business owner, the founder, the CEO, um, particularly a privately held firm, what are, what are the top one or two mistakes that they may make when it comes to the relationship with their CPA or in understanding their financials? What, what, what would that be? Um, the, the two biggest mistakes that I've seen is one, um, they kind of, sometimes people tend to reach out when the house is on fire, right? So instead of, instead of having that constant communication while things are going okay, how can we make it better versus, Hey, I need you to call me right now. Or, Hey, I need help because my business is going under. So, you know, it's I, even comparing it to like when we pray, you know, like do we only pray when we need something or do we do it even in the moments when things are going great and how can it become better? What can I do? So that's really probably the biggest mistake that I've seen happen. Okay. Well, I, that, I appreciate that. And just, just one little tag along with that. Um, how much time should a business owner spend with their accountants or financial people on forward planning as opposed to just looking at the numbers, you know, looking at the last quarters, the last six months, financials, what's that ideal balance? What should that look like? So we call it forecasting, which is just trying to predict based on some trends or based on some things that they have in the pipeline, like, we have potential new clients that we're going to sign. So we always do it. Like I spend with some of the bigger clients, so I'll spend about an hour or so a week with them and just like, okay, this is what's happening this week. Cause it could change. Forecasting will literally change day by day. So um, we like to do forecasting with three months ahead of time. So that way we could see the train before we get hit by it. That's what we always mm -hmm. say. You know, you can see it a mile away. Okay, like how, how can we prepare for this? Or, hey, we know this is a slow season. How can we kind of rev ourselves up and get ready for that, you know, before we end up finding ourselves in the middle of it and are trying to dig ourselves out? So, yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Well, thanks. I, I feel like I have a little better understanding of your firm and what I should be looking at as a business owner. Really, what I'm taking away from this portion of our conversation is the importance of regular and ongoing interaction Mm -hmm. with my financial, you know, uh, professionals and not just, as you said, when the house is on fire. And I think that's a great, great tip. So appreciate that. So tell, tell us then a little bit about uh, your faith journey. Um, how did you come to Christ? What, what did that kind of look like? So this is, <laughs> I would say it's an interesting story. Um, so I actually grew up. Um, so my family is from South America. So we're from Colombia and we grew up in the Catholic church. So I went to Catholic school my entire life, which I always appreciated because I understood certain things. And prayer was a big thing that I remember being taught at a very young age. When I was six years old, I lost both of my parents within the same year of 1992. And they ended up passing away, you know, long story, but basically um, my father ended up stepping out on the marriage, having an affair and contracted AIDS while AIDS was still very big and new. So that kind of rocked the entire family. But the good thing was, is I always had like 
uh, God involved in some way. I didn't understand what a relationship with God was until I was probably about like 25 years old. You know, that was kind of that separation. Like I didn't understand it fully. I didn't actually own a Bible or start reading the Bible until I was about 25 years old. So I was always appreciative of the fact that I had some type of interaction or understanding. Um, but was, what was interesting was I didn't actually get saved until I was 30. I'm 34 mm. now. I didn't get saved until I was about 30. Um, and the reason was, was I was, um, I used to do competitive dancing and I would travel a lot. And I still remember this day because it was the day that changed my life. So I was going to go to China to do a, a week tour with my dance partner. And I called my grandmother. She was the woman who raised my siblings and I. And so I'm just calling her and I'm talking to her, you know, just letting her know what's going on. And I said, hey, when I get back from China, I'm going to take you out to your favorite restaurant because it was going to be like around Mother's Day. And I remember she just started crying and I was just like, oh my goodness, why did I make my grandmother cry? Like, what did I say? And it was very interesting because her entire demeanor changed. It almost felt like her voice, I don't want to say her voice changed, but there's something shifted in that moment. And she began to be very passionate and tell me, keep God in everything. Don't forget about him. Keep him involved in everything that you do. Now, my grandmother was always known as a woman of faith, but she wasn't per se the evangelist. She didn't ever share at that level and not that passionately. So I remember when I hung up the phone, I was sitting next to a friend and I said, I think my grandmother's gonna pass away while I'm in China. And you know, you tell somebody that and they're just like, wow, that's terrible. Why would you think that? I said, something's gonna happen when I go away. So I come back from China. I remember I land in JFK, I turn on my phone and I get a text message and it said, your grandmother's in the hospital. She went into the hospital for something very small, and then it kind of began to deteriorate. Uh, she ended up having lung cancer. So by the time I came back and got to see her, it was very difficult for her to breathe. They had an oxygen mask on her. Um, so that was the last real conversation I had. She ended up passing away a month later. And that was the very last conversation that I had with her, and I always appreciated it because I knew that the Holy Spirit was speaking through her, and I knew that she, it was kind of one of those like, I. And people have shared stories like my, she knew without really knowing, like, you know, some people say like, you know, you're, there's something about you that, you know, and she would share with people like something's going to happen this year. And so I felt like maybe somehow inside she knew and she felt like she wow. had to tell me that. And so that was what changed my life. And the very next day after she passed away, I went down to the beach and I kind of just let it all out. And I just cried out to God and I said, I need you to help me. And that was the moment that I, and that I kind of pinpoint, and I repented of everything, and I pinpoint and say, okay, that was the day that I gave my life over to the Lord, and that was the thing that changed everything for me. Wow, that is really an amazing story, and so that was what, four years or so ago, five yeah, years ago? About, yeah, four, almost five years ago. Yeah, so um, that's one of the beautiful things I love about these conversations here on Bottom Line Faith, is we don't always know where the conversation's gonna take us. And so I didn't know this, obviously, about your story. So what, what advice or encouragement, Liz, would you have for somebody who's listening to this right now? And I don't know exactly how I want to ask this, so, um, but I'm just going to try. Um, maybe there's a, a family member or a friend or a loved one that they know they're not living right. Maybe they know that they're living apart from the Lord or so forth. And we never know when that last conversation, right, is going to occur. Mm -hmm. So what advice or encouragement would you have for somebody who's listening to this right now and just wondering what to do with this part of the dialogue? What would you, what would you encourage them to do? Well, here's my question. Do you, do you want to know what I would tell to somebody who's a believer or somebody who maybe is not a believer? Yeah, let's say that um, that's, that's fair. So let's say somebody that uh, is a believer mm -hmm. and there's somebody in their life, family, friend, loved one, coworker, whatever. And what would you have them say? I mean, because we just never know when that last conversation is going to be. You know, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I would just really honestly say like, my what's kind of pushed me a lot is just kind of thinking of I my biggest regret would be 
not sharing that with somebody, not sharing the truths with somebody. So I've shared with family members, and even though it can be hard, and even though somebody may reject what you say, at least you can know that you did your part and you planted the seed, and, and God will water it. God, you know, he'll, he'll bring the increase, but, you know, that's kind of my thought process behind it is just share that, share the truth with somebody and allow God to do the rest of it. Yeah, that's really important. You know, I've done, gosh, probably north of 150, 160 interviews here for the program. And there are some things that I've learned over the last three years hosting this program. And one of them is what you're talking about is you never know when that last conversation is going to occur. So many of our guests have these kinds of stories, these kinds of situations. And I love it that you've shared this because, um, and I'm trying to apply this in my own life. It's like, okay, you don't know Mm -hmm. when the last time is, you know, the Bible says, don't let the sun set on your anger. Don't go to bed angry. Right. And so I think this is just a great encouragement for our listeners to just like, Hey, there's somebody in your life right now, maybe that God's prompting you through this conversation with Liz to pick up the phone, drop them a text, call them, you know, go see them because you just don't know. And I I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, thanks for that. Um, Folks, uh, I'm just going to kind of interrupt our conversation here and let you know that I'm speaking with Liz Becerra, the Chief Revenue Officer with Financial GPS. They're located in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. Liz, if someone is uh, listening, they want to contact you or learn more about the firm, what's the best way for them to reach out and get connected with you? Sure, they can actually just shoot me an email directly. It's Liz at financialgps.co, or they can view the website, financialgps.co. Um, and they can get more information. Super, super. Okay, so I I can't go any further without kind of circling back around. Now, you you talked earlier when you were sharing your story, you were like a professional dancer or something. I mean, you know, for this this guy, that that, that wouldn't be me, but tell us more about that part of your journey. Yes, so I began uh, Latin dancing when I was 15 years old. I was a sophomore in high school, and it was something that my older sister was doing. So my younger sister and I naturally wanted to do what my big sister did, So we started taking dance classes together and I just, I caught on and I just really enjoyed it. And it ended up being something that I did for 17 years. Started at 15, I became professional at 21 and I started traveling the world. I did competitions. I coached people. I did tons of workshops. That's why I said I love teaching. I just really, Mm -hmm. teaching. I taught classes. um, And I I was a business manager. I managed a dance studio. And uh, which is one of the reasons why I love working with small business owners who don't understand numbers because I used to be that person and I know Mm -hmm. what would happen. So, yeah. Yes, I did that for 17 years. So, okay. So I'm confused, not confused, but you got to help me understand when, when I hear you say professional dancer, I mean, I would get doing lessons and being paid to teach people, but is there like career earnings that you can travel around and win? Or is this like, I don't know. Tell me more about that. So, um, are you basically asking like, is it a lifestyle that you can maintain and like still have, like that could be your source of income? It can yeah. be, it can be, it's, it can be tricky though. Um, so what's interesting about it is I didn't fully comprehend um, <laughs> managing finances when I did it because in that lifestyle, you have a very different concept of money. Money comes in quickly and it comes in big chunks, but it doesn't come in consistently. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the thing that I learned. It wasn't a steady paycheck. It could rain one day. Somebody could just decide they didn't want to come to class. So it's, it's very tricky, but yeah, there is, you can, it's just, it's exhausting. You know, you have to always be out there on the road. You have to be in front of people, people, especially now with social media and stuff, they'll forget about you within a week if you're not <laughs> constantly out there. So yeah, I had to maintain that for a very long time. Do you still dance? I don't No, I, I, um, now I just, I do accounting and I do all of that <laughs> stuff. Um, now, can, if the question really is, can you still dance? Yes, I can, but I don't, I don't do it professionally right. anymore. I don't even teach. Yeah. New but calling, I, I right? I enjoy it every once in a while. <laughs> every once in a while, if you throw on a little music, I can't say I love so. it. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit now about faith in business and faith in leadership. And one of the things, um, I understand you, you've talked in the past with some of the audiences when you get a chance to share how business owners' personal spending habits can affect their business. Yeah. Elaborate on that a little bit. I find that very fascinating. Tell us more. So I actually was invited to speak um, 
here in Philadelphia and it was a Christian based business. And they said, Hey, can you talk about finance? And they, they let me decide on whatever the topic would be. And I think they wanted me to just kind of go in and talk about like, you know, budgets and, and all of this. And I, I kind of came in and, and it was something that I had prayed about. And I just, God put on my heart, like your per the, what you do in your personal life at home, what you do in your closet and what you do, it's going to manifest and it's going to kind of leak out in different areas. And I've seen that, like I've seen businesses where the spending is just kind of a little out of control or maybe it's just a little messy. And then you kind of get to learn more about people and you'd be like, Oh, okay. A lot of it is just something that's happening at home. It could be, it could be marital issues. It could be stress. It could just frustration. But really what I talked about with, with, with that was just dealing with the heart um, you know, dealing with, with things like that and just knowing where money and, and status have its place and not to idolize it because it can, like I said, it can manifest in different ways. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of business owners feel like, Hey, it's my business. It's my income. I can kind of do it this way, but that's cool. I get that. But where does stewardship play into all of that? And where does, you know, especially for the Christ follower, understanding that they have responsibilities to their customers, to their vendors and employees, kind of what's that balance or that tension of, hey, this is kind of my business and yet I've got to be a steward. What's, what's that look like? A lot of times what's interesting is when people come to us, it's because they need help. So you kind of already go in having some type of like upper hand of like, they're just kind of coming to you and say, what do I do? And that's where we come in and say, okay, this method is not working. You know, the, we call it commingling. Commingling is when you use your business account for personal reasons. This is not working. So what I tend to do is I, and, and it can be tricky because like you're saying, they can be like, what's my business? I know what this industry is like, but really when it comes to numbers and accounting, it's, it's a formula. It's, it's very straightforward. So I kind of come in and I, and I not only recommend changes, but I also share how it's been beneficial to other businesses or I show them how that could look. So it, it's tricky because you have to know how to talk to people and you have to know when to suggest a change and maybe when to hold back a little bit. So it's just really getting to know people and know their personalities and know maybe how much you can change right away, maybe how much you could just change here and then wait a little bit and then change more later. But um, yeah, it's kind of, you have to really just see who you're dealing with. Um, yeah, yeah, so you talk to- Okay, thanks. Um, so you talked earlier then about, um, you know, the, the, the decisions and habits that these owners have that infect their business. What are the maybe any, do you see any specific mistakes like, hey, maybe they travel too much or they overspend on um, company cars or buy too much home or do you see patterns or trends in some of the maybe not misappropriation because I'm not talking necessarily illegal things, but certainly not wise decisions. What, what do you see in biggest mistakes being? Um, I think the idea of money is a very, it, it can confuse people. So, and here's what I mean, having a credit card. Um, and we could see that people have a, a, the wrong idea sometimes of what a credit card is meant for or what a business loan or line of credit is meant for. It, it's not meant to give you money when you don't have it. It's really just meant to kind of, um, it's, it's to kind of create this gap between cash flow. So like, hey, I'm not gonna have this money for the next 30 days, but I know that this money is gonna come in. Okay, that's when you can spend it. But a lot of times the credit card is, they think of it as, oh, I have a $25,000 limit, I have $25,000. No, that means you have $25,000 that you have to pay back and we don't have the proper cash flow to pay it back. So then it becomes this cycle. So I think that's probably the biggest mistake, whether it's a high level corporate client or a small business, it's just kind of understanding what money is and cash flow is and how to really use that instrument the best way. Yeah, and so I would assume that you, your firm serves different industries, different companies, different faith systems, you know, of the owners and so forth. How do you attempt to bring your faith into your role at Financial GPS? What does that look like? What are those conversations like? How, how do you live out your faith? So really, it's kind of just applying the biblical principles that you know that we have here so one of the the biggest things is just um i like what what james uh one what is it james 119 says it's just basically being very 
slow to speak, but very quick to listen, you know? So, and, and it helps with the clients, like listen to what they're telling you first, because a lot of times what they're saying, they don't understand what it really is. So they're frustrated because this is not happening that way. But okay, but why are they frustrated? And then when you really start to dig deep and you really start to listen to them and have conversation with them, you realize, oh, well, they're having issues because they're frustrated that their business is not going this way because they want to put their child in maybe a nicer school or maybe because they need to make more money, whatever it is. So it's just being very you know, quick to listen because when you listen, you might hear something that you didn't realize was really there or you can hear between, like, hear between the lines of what they're saying. So that's really a big thing is just being very patient with them and listening and caring and loving, showing them that you care. They're a human being. They're not just another client. They're not just another number. It's you care about them and the welfare of, of their, not only their business, but also their family. And you get to know them and see what their goals are. And do you, do you have any Christian clients that you've worked with that you've seen how they live out their faith? Does any example, do any examples stand out to you or any specific, not names of course, but just ways that you've seen Christ followers living out their faith in business? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, there's one particular one that I could think of who's, who even, it's interesting because even when, when things can get a little rough, they're, they're, they'll still do their tithing and they'll still give back regardless. And it's interesting because you see God come back and then just, you know, bring the increase no matter what. So it's just that, that level of faith that they have in those moments that's always been interesting to see. And that also helps me. It really gives me encouragement too. Like, wow. You know, so I, I definitely think that's probably one of the biggest ones is that you see this level of faith, but they continue to give back and tithe and whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you see, God will always come through with it. I love that. Well, folks, one more time, we're speaking with Liz Becerra, the Chief Revenue Officer at Financial GPS out of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, area. And uh, Liz, in, in, in the notes of preparation for our conversation, there's a, you talked about, in, in just some of the things you sent, um, Proverbs 28, being one of the mm -hmm. best business chapters in the Bible. Let, let's dive into that for a couple moments. Why? Why would you... Uh, or what would you have to say to us is found in Proverbs 28 that could be some great insights from a business perspective. So Proverbs 28 is really awesome because it covers a lot of different things and it could be in life in general or business owners. Um, like for example, uh, verse 28 in Proverbs 28 says, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Um, just, it's very easy in the business world as a business owner to get caught up in wanting to be successful from the world's view and wanting to increase the profit and do this and do that and rush. And, and, and Proverbs really just tells us about that, being careful, being mindful of those things, making sure that we're doing everything, you know, and, and other Proverbs says decently and in order and just making sure that we're not idolizing those things and just really trusting for God to come through. And, and that's what I really liked about that. And there's just so much more that Proverbs 28 talks about. Um, and then it, you know, even if you go back to like, if you look at Matthew, you know, the verse that we all know, like for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. It's just kind of just reminding us like, be careful. Um, because as a business owner, it's, it's so easy to get caught up. And I think really in any industry that you work in, it doesn't matter what you do. It's so easy to get caught up in, in certain things and, and you want to see success, but like, what is success? You know, mm -hmm. so it's, there's, like you said in the beginning, it's, there's a very thin line and it's just like, mm -hmm. how do you tie the two worlds together? And that's why I like that particular chapter because it, it's, it just really gives you a lot of breakdown of, of what we can be keeping in mind as we're running the business, as we're doing things like that. Proverbs is just in general, right? Just such a great place to get up and start our day. If we are looking for wisdom, if we're looking for discernment, especially as business people, it's just chock full. Yeah. So many practical and real uh, examples from scripture, a lot about wisdom and discernment. So mm -hmm. um, as, as you were talking to, uh, it might be in Luke, I don't know if it's nine or 10, I can't remember exactly where it was, but Jesus says that if you're going to build a tower, you need to first sit down and count that cost, right? Like, do I have the resources and so forth? And so um, it's kind of your career, right? I mean, helping businesses count the cost. Is that a good way to look at it? Yeah, exactly. Knowing what you're getting into before you get into it. Um, yeah, 
because it, it's so easy to have this amazing idea and, and there's yeah. people who have great visions, but it's just like, okay, let's sit down and let's figure this out and let's forecast it and see if it really works. Or do we have all the things that we need right here, right now? Yeah. Instead of just kind of jumping in. So yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit. I can't believe we're getting near the end of our conversation mm -hmm. already, but um, I want to I want to ask you a question. Um, as a young professional female in the marketplace, what what are some maybe words of encouragement that you would have for other uh, young women who are coming up in the marketplace, kind of seeking to find their place and their voice? How would you inspire them? What would you say to encourage them? of living out their faith and becoming the woman of God in the marketplace that they need to become? The one, probably one of the biggest things that I would say is, is obviously keep, you know, just be constant in prayer, but don't focus necessarily, don't focus on what, on what the world says or what, you know, don't be a lover of, of what people think about you. Um, because, that can really trip somebody up. Oh, they don't like me. Oh, I'm not good enough. Or I don't know as much as them, but wisdom comes from God. Right. And so it's just knowing how to just kind of hand all of that over. What's interesting is that I actually went to college. I went to Temple university for theater. I didn't go to school for finance. Hmm. I learned finance from my boss who brought me in after I walked away from the dance world. He said, I'll teach you everything you need to know. And it was a lot of prayer because I, I did not think that I knew how to do it. And it was a lot of work. It took a lot of work, but it was also just, just really just trusting because I knew God was moving. And when he told me to leave the dance world and, and I was just like, okay, God, I'm just going to trust everything you're telling me to do here. So just really just staying mindful of just praying and just letting God tell you where to go. And it might not make sense and it might seem overwhelming, but he's not going to lead you astray. He's not going to tell you to go somewhere where, where you're going to fail. So that, that would be the advice that I would give because it's very easy to, to care about what other people think or say. It sure is. Uh, those are great words of encouragement. I, I really appreciate that. And I hope maybe there's a young professional woman out there listening to this and can really take that to heart that it isn't about perception. It isn't what others think, but what does God think of her? Yeah. And that's where to find her identity. So you said, you said something in part of that. Uh, answer to that question that really intrigues me. I think it's always a great conversation. You said, God led me away from one career into this. What are, what are some of the, I don't know, clues, some of the, how did you know this was God and walk us through what was that like? How'd you know it wasn't indigestion, right? I mean, like, I've just got to. Because you could take, you could take stuff for indigestion and it goes away. Um, oh, that's a good answer. Oh, <laughs> uh, when, how I knew it was him, it was because at that point I was just making sure to get in the word every day and just praying and praying. And it was this very restless feeling. Like I couldn't shake it and I tried to ignore it. And God was like, okay, it's time to go. And I was like, I don't want to go. And the, the amazing thing was that he was so patient with me. It actually took a full year for me to, to walk away from, from that lifestyle that I had lived for so long. But each step he, it was like piece by piece. And each step there was a verse, he would use the word to tell me. And, and it was kind of one of those things where like, I don't know if you've ever read the Bible and you're just looking at it and you can't move or you can't say anything. Maybe you cry, maybe you laugh, like you're completely speechless. That's what would happen because I knew that that's what he was telling me. And so like, for example, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, he, he showed me the same exact verse three different ways, like had made no sense at all when he wanted me to, to walk away from, from performing. Um, Genesis 32, when, when Jacob is wrestling with the angel, that was the verse that he gave me in, in the end of the year when he was telling me, okay, you're done teaching. And I didn't want to, but I kept wrestling with him and I kept arguing with him. And <laughs> so, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, it, it's that thing that you can't ignore it. You can't, you can't, you become so restless. Every, nothing, uh, I just couldn't do anything. Eventually I was just like, okay, fine. I surrender, I give up, just help me. And that's why I said, I, I trust whatever you're gonna do. I never imagined I would end up in, in, in an accounting firm and doing this, but you know, it, the, it's fun though. It's interesting. I've learned that, you know what, when you go with him, you have no idea where you're gonna end up. You just forgive me because I'm as I'm listening to the story, I'm like, okay, you're one part of your life, you know, you've got this fast pace, you know, dancing and all this. You would have like accounting? Really? Like seriously? Could there be anything more boring, right? <laughs> <laughs> now but the, No, but it's so but the funny thing is 
is I've always been very good at math and I've always like, my brain yeah. is very like, I like to figure out problems, but that's where kind of accounting kind of comes in for me where with the videos, you just try to make it fun. You know, and I've had people be like, really, you're an accountant? Like you're, you're just so different. I'm just like, I just try to make it fun because I know how yeah. scary number could be because I've been there. So, yeah. Well, even though our audience, uh, you know, would probably be hearing this via audio, <clears throat> we're, we're doing this call very zoom video and you've got a great countenance about your great <laughs> smile. I can, I can see why your clients think you're a lot of fun. So that's, that's good stuff. Well, well Liz, the last section, uh, a couple of questions I want to just kind of transition into is what I like to call my advice and insights section. Right. And so, um, here you are now 34 year old professional woman, um, You've got some pretty interesting things in your background and a long way ahead of you, Lord willing, of, of many years in the career and in the workforce. But uh, I'd like you to go back to think about 20, uh, 14, 15 years ago. And if you had a chance <laughs> to sit across the table from the 20-year-old version of you uh -huh. and you'd have a conversation with the 20-year-old Liz, what, what would you tell her? What, what advice and insights would you give her? I would what I would say is the things that you're stressed about right now, they really don't, they don't really matter. The things that you're, you're upset about and the things that you're worried about, they don't really matter. Like they're not that big of a deal. They have no eternal value. Um, those trophies that you're chasing, those medals mm. that you're, you're, they turn to dust. Like it doesn't matter. And because there was a point in my life where I was extremely addicted to competition and I cared about what everybody thought. And then you kind of get to a point where you realize like, you know what, like I can, I can go up to heaven and have millions of trophies and Jesus would be like, um, no, like I, you know, yeah. I, I want crowns. I don't want trophies from the world. So that's really what I would have told myself some 15 years ago. I like that. I'm writing that down. I want <laughs> crowns, not worldly trophies. That's really good. You said that before? Or was that flipping fresh and new? That no, was really that cool. Just, that wasn't even, I, that just came out. <laughs> See? <laughs> That's fantastic. I want crowns, not worldly trophies. That, that is really cool. Well, okay, so here's the trick part of the question. So let's fast forward to the 50-year-old Liz talking to the 34-year-old Liz. What do you think she might say to today's version of you? Um, pray more and be more other-centered. That's kind of what Ooh. I've been praying for, you know, more so now. Um, be more other centered because that's really what matters. Like, yeah. you know, I think when you think about when you're gone, what do you want people to think about? What do you want people mm. to say about you? She was other centered, not she was stressed because this didn't happen in her life. And she wasn't at the point where she wanted to be like, I want to, because like we talked about earlier, just sharing, sharing the gospel and sharing the truth with people. That's what really matters. So be other centered, pray more. You can never you know, you can never have too much time praying and talking to God. You can't. Uh, that's great. As an accountant, <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> There's not enough hours in the day. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, Liz, um, I can't believe we're already at the end of our time together. This has flown, and it g generally does. And I just, first of all, I want to say thank you for just investing the time to share your story and some of your insights and expertise. Just thanks for being here with us on Bottom Line Faith. I really am grateful that you're here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been fun. It has been fun. And I, so I have one more question and um, our normal listeners here at the firm know this is always my last question. I call it my 423. It's based out of Proverbs. We were talking about that earlier, chapter four, verse 23, where Solomon writes, above all else, guard your heart for from it flows all of life. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about advice and insights the last few moments here. So Let's imagine that you have an opportunity. It's towards the tail end of your life, mm -hmm. and um, you have a chance to gather your family, your friends, your loved ones, those who are most precious to you, and pass along one piece of advice. So I'd like you to fill in the blank for our listeners here at Bottom Line Faith. You ready? Above all else. I would probably tell them the same exact thing my grandmother said to me when right before she passed, and it would be above all else. Um, just keep God first and keep God involved in everything because you, you really can't go wrong. It doesn't matter what 
aspect of your life, if it's marriage, if it's kids, if it's your business, above all else, keep him involved in everything, every single piece of your life. Even those parts that sometimes we try to hide, those little chambers in our heart that we try to keep him out of, like keep him involved in everything. Because you'll never be disappointed if you keep him involved in everything. That is really simple and yet powerful and profound, right? Is just above all else, keep God first in everything. Yeah. Liz Becerra, thank you for joining us here in Bottom Line Faith. Thank you. <laughs> well, folks, uh, wow, what an encouraging and fun conversation with Liz Becerra, who's really just walked us through, you know, uh, her story of uh, coming out of competitive professional dance and, and from one uh, area of career and, and life and pace into finance and accounting with her firm there in Philadelphia called Financial GPS, and just how she loves to love her customers as she talked about with us, listening to them as real people and just really helping them solve the problems and issues within their life and in their business and really just uh, counting the cost and being, being good, wise stewards over their resources, both their financial, but their people resources as well. And that's really what we try to do here at Bottom Line Faith is really come alongside you as a Christ follower, who's a, a leader or an owner in a business or a company and say, hey, here's how you can live out your faith. Here's how you can honor God with your time, talent, and tre uh, treasure as a Christ follower in the marketplace. And that's really, as we said in our opening lines here, we want to strike that balance and discuss that balance of eternal business and real life. And that's what it's all about here at Bottom Line Faith. Hey, best thing you can do to help us out, we get asked quite a bit, is uh, first of all, pray for the continued growth and success. We are growing Month after month, we, I just got some numbers, folks, and we are growing about 15 to 17 percent per month over the last three years on the number of listeners um, worldwide. We've been getting communication overseas, people who are catching the program. And so just continue to pray for God's favor and anointing on our program. Uh, make sure to share this on your social media and your Twitter feeds and Instagram and all those other new things that are coming out that old guys like me don't even know, can't keep up with. But that's how you can continue to help the program grow. So until next time, I am your host, Ray Hilbert, here at Bottom Line Faith, encouraging you to live your faith each day in the marketplace. God bless. We'll catch you next time. Bottom Line Faith is brought to you by Truth at Work. If you'd like to hear about new episodes or listen to past episodes, visit us online at bottomlinefaith.org. You can also subscribe to the show through Google Play and iTunes.